Welcome to Hot Talk. This is Hot Talk from Cal Poly, the California State Polytechnic University in Pomona. It is also a production of Worldlink TV. Hot Talk is a weekly show. I'm Saul Landau, your host, and we're broadcasting today from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And I'm fortunate to have as a guest in studio with me the German political scientists and journalists and old friend Jochen Hippler. Welcome to Hot Talk, Jochen Hippler. Hi, Saul. And uh, I want to tell people that you wrote a very, very important book called The Next Threat, Western Perception of Islam. Now, you wrote this by five, six years ago, published by Pluto Press, so people want to get it. Remember, it's The Next Threat, Western Perception of Islam. Now, this was long before the events of 9-11, and you traveled, as I recall, you going off into Pakistan and Afghanistan and other parts of the Muslim world. So, uh, what did you find in your various journalistic travels in these countries in the 90s? You know, the surprising thing for me as a European traveling, whatever, from places to Morocco, Libya, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, up to Afghanistan was that beneath the surface of, you know, everything being different, looking different, smelling different, people having different languages and a different religion, the commonality that, you know, beneath the surface that everything looked strange and alien and different, that many basic things in the lives of people were very familiar to what I knew from my own society, which I knew from Europe or from North America. And that was the biggest surprise probably, you know, because um, as a foreigner going there, the first impression is it's a different world. But then if you get familiar with people, you discover that job is important, family is important, you know, making sense out of confusing life is important, and sometimes the way how uh, people deal with these problems is slightly different, but the basic problems in lives is much the same. That was the main surprise that I stumbled into there. Uh, and what, what is that basic commonality that you found in the Muslim world? Yeah, you know, if you talk to people, to young kids, if you talk to middle-aged people, if you talk to different people, what is important in your life? They will tell you, oh, it's, you know, it's my family, it's my wife, it's my husband, it's my children. Uh, important is to have a job, to be able to support my family. It's able to live in peace without the police, you know, um, making, creating trouble for me without anybody pushing me around and telling me what to do. And if I would ask the same questions to people in the Netherlands or in Germany or France, it would be pretty similar, I guess. You know? mm -hmm. So these very important basic things in life are very identical. Sometimes the way they talk about it is different. They may sometimes use a religious terminology when they talk about it. Less so than I would do in Germany, for instance. But still, it's, you know, children, family, being happy, having a job, being able to buy consumer goods. These kind of things are very much center stage. Well, where did you encounter the fanaticism? I mean, it, when you traveled, say, in Pakistan and Afghanistan, did you encounter this uh, zealot, zealous fanaticism that later turned into the, if you like, uh, the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda and the events of 9-11? Oh, yeah, sure. You, you, you know, run into all kinds of different approaches. You run into people who are so tolerant that I feel ashamed being a European, and you run into wild fanaticists, you know. Like, give you an example, um, when I was in Afghanistan the first time, which was in 1988, I still have two pieces of missile in my head from a missile attack which was, you know, shot at a group of eight journalists traveling Nangaha province in Afghanistan by a fundamentalist group which was supported by the U.S. government. So I still have two pieces of a good U.S. surface-to-surface -surface missile some, somewhere here. Um, I was threatened personally by a fundamentalist leader, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, that if I would, you know, always go on telling bad things about him, and he was a terrible man, you know, um, drug dealer, torturing, this, the, the usual He's still thing. alive. He's I still think. alive. So he was threatening per me personally, I should be very careful what I'm writing about him. So I did meet hypocrites, dangerous people, and the opposite. So it's a wild mixture. 
So the United States, in a sense, was paying, well, the United States was financing and encouraging some of these fanatics. At the time, they were attacking the Soviet troops, supposedly uh, occupying uh, Afghanistan. The United States wanted to rid Afghanistan of Soviet presence, and then some. Oh, yeah, sure. Then this Hekmat Yar guy, he received about 70%, that's the common guess, of American, you know, support, which were, may have been 3 million, uh, 3 billion, maybe 3.5 billion US dollar in the 1980s. So that was definitely a policy trying to put pressure, you know, on the Soviet Union by using people who are very unpleasant, you know, very fanatic, very dangerous people, but trying to point them to the Soviet Union as their enemy, um, and that obviously backfired, you know. Well, yes, I think uh, Chalmers Johnson in his book called this blowback, didn't he? Yeah, he did, and it, it was, you know, basically paying people to use terrorism, to use violence against some Afghan factions on the one hand and against the Soviets on the other, but, you know, they always were not very pro-Western. They were always dangerous people and not just now, you know. Now, did you pick up a lot of the anti-Western sentiment when you traveled throughout the Arab world? I do pick it up, but it's basically an exception to the rule. You know, even when I went to Baghdad at a time of tension, when the U.S. government was threatening to bomb Baghdad again because of some crisis. This is in the mid-90s? It was in the mid-90s, early, early and mid-90s. I was treated very politely and friendly. People thought I was American because I spoke English, uh, but they still invited me to come to their homes and get a cup of, co a cup of cups of tea and have a talk while, you know, the U.S. government was threaten threatening to bomb Baghdad. Um, so I have in many cases seen admiration for the West, more than I personally think is justified. Very naive kind of admiration, like you guys have created a thing like airplanes. You must be wonderful, because if you're able to create such a wonderful mechanism for flying humans. Um, and sometimes the problem is that people in the Middle East do admire the West, do admire America, but then they are disappointed. They feel let down. They feel abused. Mm -hmm. They think, if they are so good, if they are so smart, if they are so wonderful, why do they treat us so shabbily, so badly? And then, you know, you get a love-hate relationship. It starts with admiration for Western achievements, human rights even, you know, um, wealth, technical achievements. And then when the experience is that the Western countries don't take them seriously, they get, you know, appalled and develop a kind of love-hate relationship. Well, how does this translate into politics? In, well, you went to countries like uh, Syria, Algeria, Libya, uh, Morocco, Egypt include. How, do, how does this sentiment get translated then into politics, given the governments of these countries? Oh, yeah, what happens to some, some degree is that the governments officially have to be pro-Western, right? As much as possible. Algeria, Except for Libya, say. Except for Libya. But they would love to be, but you know, the US government isn't allowing them to be, right? Uh -huh. because, but the Libyan government would love to get closer to European Union and to be pro, pro, uh, more pro-Western than in the past. Anyway, so you have governments who for, you know, economic and political reasons want to be pro-Western. And um, what they sometimes do is they ideologically, they try to, on the one hand, to behave very much pro-Western and get negative reactions by parts of the population. Because their impression is, the, the people's impression sometimes is, that their governments are puppets of Europe, puppets of North America, and they would like to have a government which is, you know, perceived as, you know, independent and strong and representing their own people mm -hmm. and not representing British, German, French, American interests. So that is one aspect. How so there is a tension between the governments and parts of the population very often, because you know the governments have to you know align themselves more with the West than some people in the population would like. Well, after traveling throughout the Muslim world, and you travel, I think, more extensively than any other journalist that I know, maybe with the exclusion of uh, Ahmad Rashid. Uh, uh, were you shocked when the events of 9-11 took place? 
Oh, sure, I was shocked. You know, when I heard about this, I was at the university in my office. First, I thought, you know, the person who gave me a phone call was crazy. You know, it was just too wild to imagine. Then I went home and watched it in television, and my first impression was, it's a movie, it's just not real. And my second thought then was, this will mean war against Iraq. So I first thought it was such a disaster for New York City, which is hardly, it was very difficult to believe. My second uh, emotion was, it's a disaster for the Iraqi people, because the US government, no matter who is behind it, is tempted to settle old scores and will probably start, you know, a major conflict with Saddam Hussein in Iraq. That were my two first impressions. But, uh, in other words, but you, not, did you think, when you started to think about what could have caused this, what was the, in your mind, having spent so much time, including with some of these fanatics, what did, why do you think they did it? Or at the time that it happened? At the time, I was a bit cautious because, you know, these dramatic kind of pictures on, on, on television, they tend to emotionalize us, right? So I was trying to, you know, have this compassion for the victims and at the same time being a little bit cautious with judgment because I didn't know who was behind it. Everybody was talking about, you know, who, who had done it, but there was no evidence, there was no proof, there was no inquiry, it was just guessing. So I was trying to restrict myself from guessing. So I thought that, you know, this connection with Al-Qaeda might be behind it, but I wasn't sure because so often people lie to us with, you know, political intentions that mm -hmm. I really wanted to see some, you know, evidence before judging. Well, George Bush explained it that they hate us because we're free. And that was the extent uh, of his explanation. Yeah, but that's a bad joke, right? Because, you know, people want to be free, but, you know, um, they would like to be free themselves, but they wouldn't object to, you know, me being free and you being free. They just don't like being oppressed when we are free. So that didn't make any sense. They were hitting the symbols of power. You know, the World Trade Center is a symbol of economic power in the world. Hitting the Pentagon was the symbol of military power in the world. So these attacks, as ruthless as they were, were not really about values, they were about power. And, you know, still they were brutal and, and cruel, but we shouldn't confuse that, you know. Well, um, I'm talking with Jochen Hippler, who is a fellow at the Transnational Institute and uh, who is also a member of the Institute for Development and Peace in Duisburg, Germany, and the author of a very important book, The Next Threat, Western Perception of Islam, published by Pluto Press. You can get that book by going to one of your dot coms. You're listening to Hot Talk. This is Hot Talk from Cal Poly, the California State Polytechnic University in Pomona. It is also a transmission of WorldLink TV. I'm Saul Landau, your host on this weekly show where we deal with hot topics. And today I want uh, to ask my, my guest, Jochen Hippler, who is not just a journalist, but a, a political scientist, as I said, the <coughs> Institute for Development and Peace, which is uh, an institute for analysis. 9-11 happened. Obviously, this changed the world. Uh, I think everybody who watched or heard about this event knew the world was going to change, albeit we didn't exactly know how. Now, you've had now some months <laughs> to digest this. Please put take your journalist hat off for a second, put on your political scientist hat, and give me your make on how uh, the world has changed, if you like, from a geostrategic point of view. I think the major starting point is that the world is changing anyway, right? It is a very funny idea that the world would be stable and not changing. So if I you know, think about um, September 11th, my impression is that it has generally reinforced specific changes, you know. It has made them faster, it may have made them stronger, but I don't think it really has created a new chapter in history. Before September 11, there was a tendency for the last couple of years in international relations where the European countries and some other countries wanted to have a cooperative international system, using the United Nations, having bilateral, multilateral kind of problem-solving approaches. While the American government has very strongly favored unilateral approaches, 
basically trying to use its strong you know, position in the world uh, system to support its own interests on the expense of other countries. So there was tension between Europe and America, between third world countries and America, this kind of thing. But this unilateral approach has happened before, under Clinton and then um, with President Bush, um, the second one. Okay, so uh, this is old, but September 11 has reinforced that. Now, with being attacked so viciously in New York City, the US government, my impression is as a European political scientist, has after first phase of being in shock itself, utilized this experience to selling to the world that US unilateral approach is the way to go and has tried to use the shock and the emotions and the, you know, the victims to justify a policy which it has started before, which means unilateral ways of you know, running the show, the global show. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think this dramatic event has pushed it a bit further, has helped it justify, but it hasn't started this kind of thing. Well, what amazes me is that Europe is so timid that here Europe has gotten itself together, it has a common currency, except for England, uh, it has uh, dropped many of the restrictions on the border, its, uh, its links have become stronger than ever. Uh, the European Union is a fact. The, uh, the economies of countries like Germany or even Holland, where we are today, are strong economies. They're performing very well. Why is it, in your opinion, that the Europeans are so docile uh, when the United States says uh, do something the Europeans either are silent or they do what they're told yeah that's a very big important point you know the economy of Europe is bigger than the American economy the population in the European Union is bigger than the US population and still you're perfectly right emphasizing that, you know, the European governments are not, you know, getting together, getting their act together and, you know, talking to the US government on an equal basis. And one of the reasons is that they are, despite all this unification elements, you know, the currency, you know, the euro currency, there is a bit of competition between several of the nations of Europe, you know. For instance, you take Tony Blair in Britain. He tries to get some political mileage out of some special relationship with Washington, right? He tries to strengthen his inter-European position by always telling, you know, the French and the German, the Italian governments that he is more important because he has close links to Washington, uh, while other governments disagree. You have some subtle, you know, cooperation and competition between France and Germany on who is, you know, the most important country in the European Union. So you have all kind of contradictions which have sometimes economic reasons, sometimes political reasons. And if you spend half of your energy struggling and, you know, squirreling, you know, among yourself, you have a less good bargaining position, a position of strength compared to others like Washington. And the final thing is, military power. My guess is that the European defense expenditure per capita is less than half of what the United States spends on defense. And if you are having a world situation where you know, military might is a key thing to buy influence, then Europe you know, has a disadvantage there because we spend less money for tanks and, and guns and, and you know, military stuff. Well, this is also based on a realistic threat assessment, isn't it? Yeah, you know, Europeans, after the Cold War ended, basically thought that, you know, um, we are quite secure. The Soviet Union doesn't exist to threaten our borders. Um, there was no other credi credible, you know, enemy available. So there wasn't a big, you know, rush to buy more weaponry because we thought, you know, we are safe. There's no, we are surrounded by friends. That's the position here. Well, I remember a hearing in the U.S. Congress where a senator is asking a general who is coming up for defense appropriation with this enormous budget. And the senator says, uh, General, the Soviet Union is gone. Uh, and still, you know, you're asking for this enormous budget. How do you justify this? And the general looked very sternly at the senator and says, Senator, it's a dangerous world out there. 
And I thought to myself, Adam and Eve could have said this and demanded from God a huge defense budget, right, <laughs> on this kind of logic. Uh, but nevertheless, this is what uh, the American military did, and, and, and by and large, they got away with it. And now, after 9-11, I mean, they, they have an almost unlimited budget. Uh, now, the Europeans, obviously, ha having, a, as you say, a stronger economy, uh, are doing different things. But uh, let, me, let me put it to a different way. Take a look at the European leaders. Does any of them emerge particularly as a visionary? Oh as my God, no, not at all. <laughs> you know, we have, you know, you, again, you take Tony Blair. His own party people in Britain call him the poodle of Bush, right? Mm -hmm. You have, you know, um, a very complicated situation in France where you have a progressive, more or less progressive majority in parliament, but a conservative government, which means they can't do anything before the next election. You have a situation in Germany, again, where you have a chancellor, you know, a head of government who is anything but a visionary, but, you know, a, a good tactician, you know, a good handicraft people how to manipulate power. Mm -hmm. We don't have people, we don't have, you know, politicians in Europe that I could see that I would know of who are able to have a strong leadership position, who give a vision, who give you know, sense to politics and to unite the others. I don't see that at all. So you have essentially a political class has emerged. That is people, uh, well, I mean, Bill Clinton seemed to me the epitome of this. He was a very brilliant uh, uh, man who had incredible political talent. Uh, but he didn't seem to care what he used it for. In other words, his job, as he saw it, was to govern, no matter what it was for. His job was governing, and uh, I mean, Tony Blair seems to be the same way. And uh, I mean, we've just seen, you know, uh, you do lots and lots of favors for the United States, and what does it give you back? Yeah, yeah. that's the point, you know. They are even sometimes not competent to be opportunistic properly, you know. <clears throat> what, they, what they are to the European politicians to a big degree, for me, seems to be administrators, but not politicians. Politicians should think and organize societies in a way what is good for societies, right? But then you have to make hard decisions, you have to, you know, be a bit creative, and then you, you know, convince people that you are doing the right thing. While the, the political class in Europe that I can see is basically more interested in administering things without changing anything. You know, they, they basically they think that society is on the right track, so you better, you know, be careful that you keep your job, make minor adjustments, but basically you stay away. So we have a political class which is not interested in political things. And that has something to do with stagnation now, you know? Well, I think uh, it, it, there's a political stagnation. I mean, the voters seem not to be very enthusiastic, let's put, to put it mildly, about the current uh, governments, despite the fact that there's prosperity, which is unusual, is it not? It is, and, you know, prosperity is just around the corner, you know, we, we are expecting a major upturn economically the second half of this year, so it's not as good as it will be next year, um, but still, you know, you're right, the situation isn't that bad, but people got, you know, bored with their politician, they don't go to the polls any longer because they think there is no choice, it's just a boring bunch of people dividing the spoils, people are disgusting with the political class, Lots of, you know, there's lots of talk about corruption in all countries. Talk Belgium, Italy, Germany, you know, all kinds of places. So what you have is a deficit of political alternatives. People think no point going to a vote if there is no choice. And there is this, this image, you know, growing that this political class of politicians just are crooks enriching themselves and not doing their jobs. So we do have functioning democracies but it's being discredited to some degree because politicians are being perceived very badly in these days and with good reason. Yes, now uh, we've also seen the case in Germany where the Greens or people who used to be green have now joined the government and are, well, it's very difficult to see much difference now, for example, between Joschka Fischer uh, and his counterparts in the rest of Europe, is it not? Yeah, there isn't a big difference left, you know. So I agree, the Greens and the Social Democrats formed a coalition which was supposedly bringing, you know, big reform projects in, in our society, and this just hasn't happened. Instead, it was the government who sent German troops into fight and war the first time since the end of the Second World War. So all the symbols and the reality 
were quite different. You know, they have a conservative economic policies, you know, policies, you know, cutbacks, austerity measures on the one hand, and a very, you know, military-oriented foreign policy, which even our conservatives didn't dare to do. So people are disappointed and just wonder why they should vote for these guys again. Well, I think that uh, behind all of this, uh, how shall I say it, mediocrity in the political world is a, a common, if you like, spiritual value that has been implanted certainly in the last 10 years of globalization. And I think the only universal value that exists, certainly if you watch the television, is shopping. <laughs> and that these, uh, if you like, political leaders embody that value. Uh, they don't say it out, except, well, George Bush did say it. He said, the patriotic thing to do after 9-11 is to go on a shopping spree, take your family to Disneyland. I yeah, think that yeah, was his yeah. specific uh, instructions to the American public as to how to uh, recover from no the, the shock of 9-11. Uh, do you see any, in, in the last few, in the last minute, really, we have Jochen Hippler, uh, do you see any positive uh, signs on the horizon? I think there are positive signs, but they are a couple of years ahead. You know, I think that younger people, after a few years of being out of politics and not being interested, seem to be more interested in how to deal with globalization, you know, on a more you know constructive way than it is. Um, I see the you know there is potential for a new you know whatever a new activism maybe because people are so disgusted with politics. But this is way ahead. I don't see it today. Well. I want to thank you, Jochen Hippler, who is a fellow at the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam and uh, at the Institute for Development and Peace in Duisburg and the author of Western Perception of Islam, The Next Threat.